us, God. We want to know you. We want to carry you with us. And so, God, just unlock things in our lives and teach us stuff, we pray today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Morning. Can you get your Bibles out, please? We're going to read some, some of the living word this morning. It's going to be good. And can we turn to Acts 12? Acts 12 is what we're going to read. So we're following our, um, our series in Acts. And uh, this morning we're going to be reading about Peter's miraculous escape from prison, which is great. But we're going to read all of 12 because there's, uh, and then we're going to go into unpacking that. So, Acts 12. Okay. So, from verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested Sum whom belonged to the church. Intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentry stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison. We had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. And then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people gathered and were praying. Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and a servant girl called Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went to Judea and stayed there for a while. He had been quarreling with people of Tyre and Sidon, and now they joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of God, not of man. Immediately, Herod did not give praise to God 
and an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread, and when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Amen. So, here we have it. There's a lot happening in Acts 12. We have James dead, Peter in prison, and King Herod basking in the popularity and the power of what he's just done. And then as we've read through Acts 12, towards the end, we have Peter freed, Herod himself is eaten by worms and dead, and the word of God is increasing and spreading. I think it's fair to say a lot's going on, guys. But I think it's important that we look at what we've just read in context to what's happened before. You see, up until this point, the church has been on this hot streak. Take my, take my Wally glasses off. I don't need those anymore. Yay. So the church has been just conversion after conversion. Yeah, it's been growing massively quick, experiencing all the great things of the early church. And they'd had some really kind of headlining conversions. You had Saul of Tarsus, and we had uh, the centurion, Cornelius. Remember those guys? So this, this was, and, and, and Lucas spoke, didn't he, last week about um, the church in Antioch, yeah, where both Jew and Gentiles were, were being converted, and, and there was conversions there, and the church was growing in its thousands. So right up until this point, it's been just good news for the church. Growth, growth, conversion, conversion. Everything's happening. Everything's going to plan. And then, bang, Acts 12. The enemy shows up, raises his head. And here at the start of Acts 12, we see the first opposition, the first stand, if you like, against what God is doing. Now, I don't know about you, but does that not, sound familiar with our own lives you're everything's going great with God yeah you're hearing God your quiet times are amazing um, you hear God's voice church is great everything's going amazing in fact you're thinking wow my journey with God's just never been better it's fantastic and then bang health care you get knocked back on your health. Something happens to you. Uh, your boss at work, for no reason at all, starts calling you out on things unfairly. We've all been there, right? Yeah? It just seems to be that that is the way life goes. Suddenly, things start panning up. Suddenly, your finances start going astray for no reason. And you're like, what is going on? And the enemy loves to just have a poke, doesn't he? He loves to try and pull that rug from beneath your feet. And here we have the disciples in the early church who are facing that, that rug being pulled from underneath their feet. And the, this is the first time these guys have really experienced anything like it. You know, someone's just died. And it doesn't get any worse than that, yeah? They're getting persecuted. Herod's after them. He's making a show out of them. In fact, the non-Christians at the time are loving what Herod's doing. They're like, yeah, get these Christians. So they're really up against it. So what do they do? Well, here you see the church, and what do they do? They start praying. So I've got the next slide there. Yeah. So Peter was kept in prison verse 5 but the church was earnestly praying to God for him you see Herod had his soldiers Herod had his prisons yet here we are the church it has its prayer yeah and the word earnestly literally comes from the Greek verb uh, as it's up on the slide there Ectios, which is a medical term. Chris would love this. It's a medical term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limits. Interesting, isn't it? 
the dictionary's definition of the word earnestly is with sincere and intense conviction and then in brackets seriously now let me ask you a question church when we face opposition when we face the enemy's trying to bring us down he's trying to pull us to shreds he's trying to distract us what do we do and if we pray do we pray earnestly I know I don't not regularly anyway and perhaps our prayers are sometimes power, powerless in some ways because we're not praying earnestly too often I think we pray with the attitude of God please change our situation as long as it doesn't cost me too much do you know what I'm saying as long as it doesn't cost me too much God please will you change this for me Earnest prayer has power not because it persuades God. Let me just say, God does not need any persuasion. But instead it demonstrates that our, our hearts care passionately about the promises that he's given us through Jesus' son. And next slide up, please. So, John fifteen seven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So then we see the breakthrough which comes from the church praying in the story of Acts. Verse 6 uh, to 11, God sends this angel to Peter in prison and um, obviously he gets out of prison and the first thing that strikes me about this that we read is Peter sleeping so get this Peter's in prison he's just seen James his friend beheaded he knows what Herod's doing he knows the next day he's probably gonna kind of experience the same fate and he's sleeping don't you find that a little bit odd I don't know about you but I know whether it's an Ofsted report or it's an exam or you're waiting for results from the hospital. You know, you just, you can't sleep on it, can you? You're stirring, your mind's on it, you're thinking about it, you're tossing and turning. Or if you are sleeping, it's light sleeping. You know what I mean, yeah? Yet here's Peter facing probably being beheaded the following day and the angel turns up and that doesn't even wake Peter up. He's got to dig him in the ribs and say, oh, you, get up, awake. This guy is properly sleeping. Now, I think Peter's sleeping because he's an example of someone who's all in with God. He has the peace to know that God's plans for him are bigger and better than the plans he has for himself. Do we believe that, really? Or do we kind of take things into our own strength? I know what I do. I try and operate out of my own strength. But Peter doesn't. He knows whatever comes tomorrow, it's in God's will. And I'm good with that. So I'm just going to lay it down with God and I'm going to get some sleep. So I think that's great to hear. And I think you know, it's a challenge to us, isn't it? When we're facing those difficulties in life, when we've got those challenging times coming, when we're, under the re when we're really under the cosh, yeah, I'm going to give it to you, Father God, and I'm just going to leave it at your feet, and I'm just going to rest. Because that's what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to stress. So can we be more like Peter? when we face what seems to be the impossible circumstances. Are we all in with our faith in God? That's the big question. Are we all in with our faith in God? Okay, next slide please, Rob. 
I love this. I just put this in because I, I liked it. Faith is like Wi-Fi. It's invisible, but it has the power to connect us to what we need. It's a bit cheesy, but I kind of liked it. It kind of summed up what I was trying to say. It's good. And if you don't think that sleeping when we've got oppression is good, then you just have to look at some of the scriptures. Psalm 127 too says, for he grants sleeps, sorry, he grants sleep to those he loves. And then Psalm 23, I think we've got that on the slide, Rob. Yeah, we have, great. I love this. The Lord is my shepherd, I like nothing. He, ma- he, lies, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Is that good? It's good, isn't it? It is really good. And then we have, we see Peter, don't we? We've read it. He, the, the angel leads him out and past the, the, the guards and past everything else. And then up to the big iron gates. Yeah? The big iron gates that, that open for him. And um, I thought that was interesting, these big gates that keep you in. And as I read the scriptures, I was thinking, how many times in my life do I see the big iron gates and kind of run the other way? And I suppose we've all got different iron gates in our lives. Um, And it's easy, isn't it, to sometimes see the iron gates and and the challenges. I see them as, I see the iron gates as almost like the big challenges we have in life. And sometimes those challenges seem bigger than what God is in my life. Uh, I remember once um, I, uh, I, I went to the doctors and I had an eye test and they said, um, uh, we, 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 we believe that you, you're going to lose the sight of one of your eyes. And um, I was like, that's not good news. That's an iron gate right there. Well, what's all that about? And they said, yeah, we're going to send you to a consultant. He did lots of scans, and they found that uh, an artery was blocked behind my eye, and the, there wasn't much they could do, but they were, they were going to try and shringe it out, and it was a little, uh, not nice. So anyway, I'd gone. Uh, I grabbed Caroline on this particular day of the operation, and we sat down together, and the, 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 the doctor said, look, there's a high risk that, Craig, you're not, you're not going to have the sight of your eye after this operation but we're going to do the best we can, yada, 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 yada. And uh, one of the nurses walked in and said, uh, uh, well, you don't really stand any chance, do you? That's what she said. I was like, well, there's hope for you right there. Caroline, I, 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 was, I was like, yeah, you're probably right, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. Caroline, those of you who know Caroline, my wife, yeah, will know, uh-uh. She was like, hang on just a minute. We are not standing for that. You've just declared this over my husband. And we believe in Jesus. And Jesus is bigger than that. So we're going to pray. And this nurse was like, yeah, okay then. <laughs> like, in fact, I was a little bit like, oh, okay then. So anyway, we prayed. And uh, I had my you know, green gowny thing on, yeah. And, uh, you know, I was just about to go in for, for the op. And uh, I s- sort of, what do you do, you know? I, I, I sort of waved my wife goodbye, went off and they, they said, right, we're just going to do a final check and then we're going into the, the surgery room. And uh, they shone some lights and things in my eyes to confirm what was there was there. And um, this doctor was having a bit of a f- kerfuffle and uh, he was stressing and he called another doctor in and I was like, oh man. You know, when you get two doctors, you're like, what? those iron gates have just got a lot bigger. <laughs> I was like, hang on a minute, two doctors, and they were like not happy between them, and I was just like, what on earth is going on here? I was nervous, and I, at that moment, believe me, I was praying earnestly. And uh, they said, look, um, Mr. Press, we, 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 we've, we've checked your notes, but there's no evidence of this at all in your eye. I'm really sorry, we have no idea what's happened, but um, your, your eye's fine. You can go home. Woo! So, you know, and, and that's just an example where I saw the iron gates and I was running. I was, I was like, yeah, you're right, I'm blocked in here. 
I can't get through those gates. And I didn't really believe enough. My faith wasn't big enough for me at that point. I don't know why, but I just resigned myself to this is the way it's going to go. I wasn't believing that I was going to be blind or anything. In my eye. I was hoping for something better than that, but actually I knew I was going to have the operation because that's what had been spoken over me. Yet prayer, earnest prayer, real prayer changes situations and it changes lives. And then we read in verse 12 to 18, and this is where Peter presents himself to the church that were praying for him. And you know what? What strikes me about this is that this group have been praying for Peter to be released, right? Yeah, they've all been praying. So let's let's take it, right, that we're, um, let's just say, Steve Murphy, yeah, unfortunately is in prison, Right? I mean, that's not hard to imagine, really. So, like, you know, just... (laughs) Your offices are like a prison. Well, there you go, Steve. You're in prison, right? Yeah? And your lovely friends and neighbours and family here have heard that you're in prison, Steve, yeah? And we're praying. We're down on our knees. We're like, Lord, you need to free Steve, our brother, yeah? And then we're in the service like this, and there's a knock on the front door. And stay with his dulcet tones, you know. All right, I'm here. It's Steve. Yeah? One of you goes, Julie, you go to the back, yeah? You know it's Steve, because, you know, you know him, you know his voice, you know his Manchester twang, yeah? But you don't let him in, yeah? You come in and you say, hey, guys, Steve's at the front door. He's here, yeah? And we all go, You're off your head. Not having that. I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? Don't you you find that strange that this is a group of Christians who have just seen miracle after miracle, conversion after conversion. They're praying for Peter's release. Peter turns up at the front door and they're going, no, you're off your head. That's not him. It can't be him. Why can't it? You've just been praying for him. It's bizarre, don't you think? I was reading it and I was like, these guys are just like, what is going on here? This is the group that have been assigned to pray for Peter's release from prison. And verse 5, next slide, Rob, if that's all right. Um, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant girl came, Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she didn't even let him in. She left him standing there, and she ran back in, and she said, Hey, everyone, Peter's at the door. And they turned to her and said, You're out of your mind. And this, my friends, is where faith becomes a key part of Acts 12. Even whilst they were praying for Peter, for whatever reason, they didn't believe God had answered their prayers. The point is that whilst I'm sure their prayers were earnest, their faith wasn't. Their faith wasn't. How many times, church, do we pray and not expect those prayers to be answered? Is our faith measuring up to our prayers? When we pray for circumstances in our lives to change, do we have the faith for God to change it. You see, it's prayer and faith together. This is the key to releasing heaven on earth. And then we come to the close of Acts 12. We have Herod who was furious with Peter's escape. I mean, he must have been. This was his prize capture, Peter. Yet he's he's walked free. He must have been fuming. And we we read, didn't we, that, you know, he he examined the guards and uh, he had them executed. He had them put to death. He was not a happy king. And then Herod met with the people of Tyre and Sidon and gave a public address to which they, they shouted, this is God speaking, this is not a man. And Herod didn't correct them. And then we read on, immediately an angel struck Herod down and he was eaten by worms and died. 
Now, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, he was eaten by worms and died. Well, that's the wrong way around. Sure, he, was di- he, he, was, he died and then he was eaten by worms. But actually, it, it wasn't that. And, and it, it was because Herod was rotten from the inside out. And it was a, um, almost like a representation of the fact that that was his spiritual health that worms at him from the inside out. It it reflects how Herod was in his spiritual state. He was corrupt from the inside out. And then, obviously, eaten by worms. And did I mention we've got a shared lunch in a minute? So, yeah, just keep that picture in mind um, as we go there. And then we have this glorious end to Acts 12, verse 24. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. Isn't that marvelous? Against this setting of King Herod and all his kind of efforts to stop Christianity spreading, to stop the Christians doing what they were doing, none of it came to fruition because God had bigger plans and his word continued to spread and increase. You see, Herod fought against God But the church submitted to God and got in line with his plans through their prayers. I've got a question. Are we submitting and aligning ourselves with the plans he has for our lives? Or are we just going on, taking each day as it comes? Yeah? Thinking, no, tomorrow's this, this, this. Or are we saying, Lord, what is it that you have for me? today, this week, this month, this year, the next number of years. You see, if we're not aligning ourselves with the plans of God, then we could be missing out on the biggest adventure ever for our lives. And it's that alignment, it's that coming into a place of submitting our lives to God that we then find our faith it's possible to move mountains. Our faith then becomes something that can take us way beyond what is possible in the natural. Now, I want us to go somewhere, church. I want us to go somewhere together as a church. I'm not happy us just being in these four walls. I don't care how many people come on a Sunday. We could be absolutely rammed in here. But if it all it is is us meeting on a Sunday, doing church, I'm not interested. And you shouldn't be interested either. I want us to go somewhere. And you know what? If we're going to go somewhere that transforms our community of Warrington, that changes lives, that changes our lives and other lives, if we're going to do that, then we have to believe and have faith for it. We can't have half the room not that bothered. We can't have half of us thinking, well, actually, I'm quite happy just turning up on a Sunday. That's not what we're about. If we're going to be about transforming places, transforming Warrington, transforming our nation, then we've got to start praying big prayers. Not small prayers. Not, Lord, help me today, although that's important. We've got to start believing for bigger things. And we've got to start praying bigger prayers. And let me tell you, folks, as a leadership here, we don't have a plan B. There's no plan just to be comfortable. In fact, we've met and we've said, look, even if it ends up with five people, if those five people are absolutely submitted and going for it and want to transform Warrington, we'd rather have that than 200 people who aren't. If you're sat this morning thinking, I can't see that happening, Craig, Well, that's because you don't have the right sort of faith. And I'm saying it blunt. That's because your faith isn't the substance of things hoped for. Because let me tell you, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Evidence of things not seen. Guys, we're a church who are believing in the things we can't see. We're a church who believes in the things that haven't yet been said. When Lucas says, right, 
I believe that we're going to have a, 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 um, a place in the middle of town and we're going to be seen by everyone and we're going to be seen as a people who love and who change lives. Yeah, We've got to go along with that. We've got to get that vision. We've got to believe it. We've got to have faith for it. Because plan B, it's not effective. It doesn't work. It's not going to change anything. At some point, it's got to be less about us and more about him. And you know what? I'm going to be really blunt here. Some of you this morning, and I'm speaking to myself as well, we've got to start saying yes to God before we know what the question is. We've got to start saying, yes, I'm with you, Lord. Yes, we're going to do this. Yes, we're going to love on our town of Warrington. Whatever it is, Father, show me. I'm all in. Not waiting for God to ask us and then taking three months to decide if we want to get on board with it. We aren't going to change anything without having faith and giving ourselves to prayer regularly. You see, chains and prison, they're nothing to God. We've read it. They're no match for God. So what's chaining you this morning, church? What's changing you personally this morning? What's, what's holding you in prison this morning? It'd be different for each and every one of us, I guess. But it's a good question to ask. What's chaining me back? What's holding me back? What's stopping me from believing in transformation across our town of Warrington and beyond? Once you know what it is, once you've identified what it is, then get on your knees, church. Get on your knees, pray earnestly, because he wants to break those chains this morning, and he wants to set you free. Okay, next slide, Rob. Faith and prayer. Faith and prayer, they don't make things easy, but they partner with God. And when you partner with God, you cause transformation. That's the deal. That's how it works. If you believe it and you're praying for it, believe me, God is answering it. And we need to pray more and have more faith for what God's set us on, on this journey. So I've been quite blunt this morning, but I think Acts 12 is just a great lesson and a great story model of of what we need to be as a church this morning i don't want us to be the group or the church that prays for miracles and then when they happen leave them at the front door i want us to be a church who prays for miracles believes for miracles and then rejoices when the miracles take place that's what we need to be okay let's close our eyes let us pray for you and pray for us Lord, lead us into that uncomfortable place outside of your comfort, Father God. So that we may grow into all the new things you have for us. And Lord, let us grow our faith muscles to be ready and willing to have the faith to pray big prayers. Father God, I want to see us as a church dissatisfied just to come on a Sunday morning and just to hang out together and worship. I want to see us being a people that are transformed to standing on the front line for you and seeing our town of Warrington change and our nation change, Father God. Father, I pray you put that hunger and that faith in our hearts this morning. And I pray, Father God, that we'll have Peter experiences. I pray we'll see those that have been bound and chained and told they've got no future, walk free to the gates of Warrington and see freedom. I pray that you'll see people walk into your churches of Warrington, Father God, over, over time and, and, and see lives change and help transform this place into a place that is full of your wonders, full of your people, full of your praise. Father God, I just pray you'll motivate us 
to do something miraculous in your town for the people that you love. Help us to do that, Father God. Shake us from, from being a, uh, individuals and, and as a group of people who are happy just to, 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 to exist and be part of something that, Father God, is comfortable and feels good. The early church wasn't comfortable. The early church wasn't just a happy place. It was motivated by a heart of yours, Father God, that was going after something much, much bigger. We want to be part of something much, much bigger. So be with us, Father God, we pray. In your wonderful name. Amen. Guys, it's good Acts 12.